Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Alexander Hall. I'm the executive producer of 360 Chestnut, and this is Carol Tomensky. If you don't already know that, he's our CEO. Um, and we want to welcome you to tonight's panel, which we chose to title, Does Your Home Know Too Much About You? Which sounds kind of ominous, right? So I'm, I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about what we meant by that. Um, Google's recent buy of Nest for $3.2 billion obviously has the tech and business world buzzing, in particular because it opens up all kinds of new questions about how our homes will run technologically, but also how we are going to live in them. With the Nest thermostat acting as a portal to all kinds of other smart devices, it has the potential to collect and share data about everything from what rooms we're in, when we come home, when we go to sleep, when we wake up, and all kinds of other very personal information about us. And obviously that's raised questions in some of the community because it would potentially give Nest the ability to share that information about us with Google, which as we've seen, they're very good at selling the data that they collect about us online to companies who can then send us targeted advertisements. So the question remains if Nest is actually going to do this, but they definitely have the capability. And our mission tonight is to jump into that bigger picture of what that might mean for us and how we live. And fortunately we have the perfect people to talk about it with us. And Harold, Harold, do you want to do the honors of introducing everyone? I sure will. I'm going to start, though, with a few thank yous. And really, we couldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for all of our sponsors. And we're very happy to just take a moment to recognize them and to thank them, starting off with One Vision Resources. And we have Joey Kalinske over here, um, who you'll meet in a minute. Um, we also have Ground Energy Support. Matt and Ruth Davis are here with us. Juna Perks, I saw Mike Johnson. Um, and there's also Anita Harris of Harris Communications, and Anita just came out with her f second, third, fourth book on, on women in business, which I encourage all of you to go out and read and buy. Uh, we also have uh, energy tariff experts, and that's Jim Bride at the end. And we uh, also want to give special thanks to Control4, who are here just for today. So uh, we're really happy that you're here. And, um, and finally, when I said there's going to be a party afterwards, there is really going to be a party. And we can thank both uh, 90 plus sellers who sponsored the wine, as well as Harpoon Brewery who sponsored the beer. And, and that is all happening right after this event, which will probably be about an hour's time. Okay, and now let me take a minute and really just introduce our, our, our panelists, and I will give a very short description of them, and then hopefully they will fill in a little bit more about their backgrounds. Can I interrupt for one sec? Sure. I'm just going to jump in really quickly. We are, um, we're going to take questions after this, but if you guys would prefer to tweet questions to us, you can just follow us at 360 Chestnut, and um, we, we will have them and address them directly right after. So. <coughs> So we have on our we have on our panel tonight uh, Joey Kolchinski of One Vision Resources, Susan Cashin of Control Four, Jason Hanna over at MBU, Deborah Hurley over at IQSS, and she can tell you what that stands for. Daniel Halla at Rockport Venture Capital, and Jim Bride from Energy Tariff Experts. And I almost made a big mistake in that I did not thank all the people who actually pulled this together. And that's all of my friends here at 360 Chestnut and BTW. So we have Tung Nguyen, who's in the back. Uh, Tim Strain, Owen Considine, Caroline Egan, um, Rob Eckel, who's doing our video, and over at BTW, we have Alexandra Hall, as well as Liz, which is, is Liz here yet? I think she's still downstairs. Okay. Who, Liz, who greeted you as you came in. So on that note, why don't we just take a minute and have our panelists introduce themselves and with a quick little bio. Joey, you want to kick it off? Sure. Uh, so the company I run uh, does technology management uh, for individuals and their families and their homes. Um, and that involves being their first point of contact for anything technologically related uh, to their lives. Uh, it might be a phone call on Friday night that their Comcast internet has gone down. Well, we deal with Comcast and we make sure they 
uh, get their butts over there and fix it, and we'll meet them on site if we need to. Um, if their iPhone has shattered, we will facilitate and manage and uh, kind of ensure uh, the, the seamless uh, integration of a new iPhone very quickly. Uh, and if they need to travel to Europe uh, tomorrow, then we'll make sure all their data and uh, iPhones and iPads and computers are all set for international data. But that scales all the way up to their home automation systems as well. And, um, includes systems like Control 4 systems for managing their audio, video, lighting, control, uh, HVAC, uh, energy management. So uh, as technology becomes more integrated for our clients, they, they start to depend on us more for managing it all and being there for them. Susan? So I'm... S can you guys hear me? I hate microphones. So can you hear me? So I'm Susan Cashin, and I run marketing for Control 4, and we are smart home automation technology platform that allows consumers to automate virtually every system or device, digital device that they have in the home to personalize the, the use and integration of those devices and systems so that they can work the way they want to. Um, the the end, end result is to have more energy efficient, comfortable, secure homes homes that just do everything automatically. Great. Hi, I'm Jason Hanna. I'm the founder of Imbue. Um, we are an early stage company here in the Boston area. Um, we're somewhat narrowly focused on the uh, field of HVAC automation and management. So we have a product that uh, you could consider some of what we do similar to Nest. Um, but we have a thermostatic control, which is a hardware, it's a sensor and controller based product. Uh, but we take that information, we combine it with energy and fuel <coughs> use data, and we use that to create a picture of efficiency inside a home or inside of a small business. And we use that data and provide it to heating and cooling uh, service providers as well as building managers um, so that they can get a picture about how well that equipment is performing inside their customers' homes or inside the apartments or buildings that they manage. Uh, the idea there being that um, more energy efficient equipment has a longer lifespan. Uh, it's very good for the service provider. So unlike the Nest, um, we don't sell directly to the consumer. We work through the channel of heating and cooling service providers and other technology providers, uh, perhaps like yours, uh, to get our products into the homes of our customers. Good evening, I'm Deborah Hurley. It looks like you all have a short bio of me, so I'm not going to repeat that to you. I'll just tell you a few things. Um, I have worked for decades on the issues of protection of privacy and personal data in the digital age, so I think that's why I'm on this panel. I also wrote the first comprehensive report on security of information systems outside a government context as well, and I think computer security will probably come up tonight as well. And I want to answer Alexander's question, which is Google going to use Next da Nest data to sell advertising? Let's just get that off the table. The answer is yes. <laughs> I think we can all go home. <laughs> no, we don't need to go home. But there's a lot to discuss. But yes, yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Daniel Huller with Rockport Capital Partners. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, Rockport invests in disruptive, high-growth companies in the energy, mobility, and sustainability spaces, so including um, uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, as one of those. Um, uh, I've been with the firm for eight years. Things that you may not know from reading my biography, uh, I uh, brew my own beer and I own a nest. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, Jim Ride, Energy Tariff Expert. So, um, you know, every utility has its own schedule of rates. Uh, they're very different from one utility to the next, summer, winter, on peak, off peak. Some markets are regulated, some are deregulated. So the essence of what I do is talk about what energy costs, because uh, the answer is it depends uh, on a lot. Uh, your utility, time of year, how you use electricity or gas. Um, and so uh, that's the world I live in. Energy Tariff Experts is the company name, because we're experts in energy tariffs. <laughs> And, and I'm sorry, one more introduction before we do jump right in, and that is we have here one of our partners, uh, Next Step Living, and what they do is they help you save energy, and they are located out there, out in, uh, in one of the conference rooms. If you haven't had an energy audit or, or any weatherization done to your home, Next Step Living can help you out. They can even install a Nest thermostat for you. So with, the, with that as a jumping off point, let's get the conversation going. All right, so I'm, I will put this to Joey, uh, Susan, and Jason. We, we just want to big picture what kind of impact have you seen um, the, the Nest phenomenon ha and all of the reaction to that. What, what kind of impact has that had on your business and developments have happened since the buy happened? 
So uh, the Nest, I think, has uh, done for technology in the home a little bit of what the iPhone did for smart home or for smartphones. So we've now found our clients really caring about the technology they interact with in the homes, and uh, more than ever before during our conversations of. You know, it, it starts with, we'd like to build a smart home, and we come in and start talking about audio and video and lighting. There's actually a focus now on, on smart thermostats, and incredibly, people are actually know what they're talking about when they now say, oh, I, I want a Nest thermostat, and that, that's fantastic. So uh, as integrators and also as the people kind of looking out for our clients to help them get the most out of their technology, it's really great and helpful to see our clients now caring about the tech that they use. And I think Nest has done a, an amazing job at making it very easy to use, uh, easy to deploy, uh, and fun. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's important to remember that you know engagement, I think a, a critical component to engagement is keeping it uh, fun and refreshing and interesting. And uh, Nest, I think, really did a great job with that as it relates to, to thermostats. I'm curious about how much do you think is of that is about the marketing and, and design and sort of Apple inspired cuteness of it? Uh, so I think that only goes so far and I think it, it did a lot at the beginning to get people interested. It's uh, probably, you know, it's, it's one of the beautiful devices now in a client's home and people like showing it off. Uh, but you then have to back that up because once it's installed, you know, it just becomes another kind of device that people turn on and off, but the engagement can quickly dissipate. So what we love to showcase to our clients and make sure they're paying attention to is, for example, the weekly energy reports that they get. And it really shows people how their energy compares. And um, uh, it, so many conversations have actually sparked from our clients getting those emails and you know now they actually feel bad about using more energy than their neighbor or <laughs> a, you know whatever it might be and I think that that's that's great so I don't know uh, you know short of the usability of their universal remote which is the other thing they touch a lot I don't know any other technology in their home where they're still talking about it all the time any any engagement with our clients and the tech they use is a wonderful thing. So we've been in business for about 10 years. We founded our company 10 years ago. And the Google acquisition of Nest made home automate, put home automation on the map, despite the fact that even we were babies in the, in the market. There were a lot of other companies delivering smart home technology. Um, and so definitely awareness, because of a cool factor, um, really generated a lot of interest um, for us and our technology. So we're very grateful. Wall Street responded really positively to it. So it was a great event for us. Um, I, the other, is, so without, I think everybody is here and the whole topic of this is proof of the fact of awareness and the importance of smart home technology. Um, the second thing in, in our world, unlike consumer electronics, like buy it off the shelf world, is that um, Nest has kind of defined a standard in customer experience that um, we now all need to live up to. And it's an exquisite customer experience in product design, in user, ex user engagement, um, personalization, that is really exciting for our industry and exciting for homeowners because now the, just as you saw the delivery of the iPhone and then Samsung stepped up its game and Nokia stepped up its game and all the other competitive brands stepped up its game. So I think you're going to see massive innovation in simplicity and elegance of product design, which is fabulous for us as an industry and incredible for homeowners. So I'm super excited about that. And then the third thing in our world, because we kind of think of ourselves as the operating system of the home, you have all these different devices and how can you connect them together. Um, you know, the, the um, element of interoperability and that because of Ness's focus on exquisite customer experience, the protection it places in work and making sure that anybody who's integrating into the Nest environment needs to follow the rules of engagement Nest sets. We're really proud that so far, Control 4 and Mercedes-Benz are the only official approved integrators um, with the Nest platform. So again, that standard is really fabulous for delivering an incredibly seamless uh, um, consumer experience in the home. And then my final point, which um, I thought is really compelling for 
our business is this notion of personalization. Um, Nest knows what I need, Nest knows my home, and reacts um, to it accordingly. And smart home technology should be personalized. Like we take great credit integrators and our uh, distribution partners do a great job of working with homeowners, not just to sell technology, but to enable that technology to perform in such a way that matches to that consumer homeowner's lifestyle. And so the blend, like I think it really puts a spotlight on the importance of that council and the magic and the possibility of what all this, all this technology can do once it's personalized for a family with young children, a family with no children, a single guy who just cares about a man cave, and really looking at um, how the role of personalization. And I think, again, they've set a standard that is going to be really exciting for consumers in the years to come. Great. Um, okay, so I will try to keep mine quick. Um, you know, as someone who's also a manufacturer, in some ways, um, we are in a bit of a competitive space with Nest. Um, we address our product in a much different way. Um, many of you probably know that um, a $3.2 billion acquisition, I mean, is a brilliant thing for a company that has created a thermostatic product which addresses less than 10% of the actual market for HVAC equipment and HVAC controls. So what they have done is absolutely brilliant. I have just the utmost amount of respect for the industrial design and the way that they've marketed their company. Um, but I can tell you, we work with the other 90%. And you know, my business is working with heating and cooling contractors and working with those folks who are in the trenches who deal with um, customer installations, do-it-yourself, folks who oftentimes can't afford or aren't at the level of home automation where they're installing and can afford a customizer. Um, so there's a whole segment of the market that is yet to be addressed by a reasonably priced uh, connected product which can do these types of things. So uh, we're obviously trying to work in that space. We think there's great market opportunity. Um, so I see it as a bit of a double-edged sword. In some ways, you know, Nest is an amazing proof point. It's created so much interest in our industry. Uh, but at the same time, I talk to guys like Daniel and others who say, you know, Will there be another Nest? You know, can there be another company who competes in this space? Will there be a Samsung to the Apple? Um, so obviously, it's exciting for us. It generates interest in the space. Uh, but at the same time, um, drawing those comparisons and you know, can you be another unicorn, for lack of a better word, um, in this industry? You know, that's a question we also have to wrestle with. Yeah, which. You know, that really brings me to the next set of questions. I mean, I went to business school, uh, so I like to think I know a little bit about, you know, these companies, and I just keep on scratching my head around a price tag of $3.2 billion for a thermostat company. You know, you know, there are just not that many thermostats sold. So I'm thinking there has to be something else going on here. Um, Jim, you know, what do you think else is going on here? Uh, well, a few things, and actually, if we, we're probably going to get to it later, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about why they paid so much. I mean, $3.2 billion is a lot of money. So, Opower IPO'd last week uh, with a market cap of, uh, you know, just shy of a you know, billion dollars or so. So, you know, Nest is worth three times Opower. Um, so, um, you know, Nest, around the time of the acquisition, said they had about 1% of all household thermostats. So if you think that, okay, you know, 300 and some million people in the U.S., let's say there's, you know, 100 million uh, households, uh, there's a, that's about a million thermostats. So if there's a million thermostats, $3.2 billion is roughly $3,200 per installed device. So if you're thinking about what's the... the you know, the value per asset in the field that they're communicating with, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, and it's like 25x revenue or something obscene like that. Um, I guess it's not obscene if they're giving you the money, but, um, but, but, but so I, I think that there's a bunch of angles to it. And, you know, so one of the things that we see in Texas is the, the idea of transactive load. So uh, retail energy suppliers, Reliant, which is they're a re deregulated electricity supplier, they're a subsidiary of NRG. What they started doing about a year ago was bundling uh, Nest with deregulated electricity supplies, saying, "Hey, you know, buy electricity from us, uh, and you know, we'll give you a Nest." And what's really cool, and why Texas is the perfect place for this, is the almost the entire state now has fully deployed uh, smart meters, and the in the Texas electricity market. It, every single customer with a smart meter, their load is settled in the Texas electricity market hourly. So w what happens in Texas is occasionally prices can go completely crazy. It can get up to, you know, 
uh, 80 <coughs> kilowatt hour because there, there's no price cap on um, on how high prices can go. So think of that hottest summer day in Texas when you know the grid's really straining, um, you know, coming up against its its you know uh, generation capacity. The price signal uh, is essentially flows through to everybody. So for deregulated energy suppliers, having a nest in the house that they can control, where they can start cycling everybody's air conditioner, uh, is a great way for them to, when, uh, when prices are really high, they can reduce the load that's in their portfolio of customers. So that's very, very attractive for them. And, and Jim, just to be clear, so I could be in Texas, you know, wearing my boots, watching football, and it's a very hot day, and suddenly my air conditioning, I haven't done anything, but suddenly it starts going off. And that's because the utility has actually shut my air conditioning. Yeah, and in this case, it's a great question. And the distinction is it's not really the utility, it's your deregulated electricity supplier. So the idea is in a lot of markets that are deregulated, there's the, the utility. So NSTAR is a deregulated utility. Their job is to maintain the wires, which is the local monopoly distribution function. But you can buy third-party electricity supply from anyone. The reason Texas is such an exciting market is that everyone's got a smart meter and, and the consumer really is engaged in the market. So in places where people don't have smart meters, you know, third-party electricity suppliers might try to market on price or savings and stuff like that. But in a market where there's end-to-end -end integration between the wholesale power market and you, the end-use consumer, that's when really fun stuff can start to happen. And where the nest becomes a, uh, you know, a, a way to modulate your consumption and that, you know, they don't want you, you know, sweltering at home, uh, you know, and, and watching, you know, sweating watching your, your football game. But what they can do is cycle units so that, you know, the set point may drift a little bit, but no one's going to be uncomfortable. But by cycling those units, they can you know, really reduce the amount of power they manage. And I think while we're on the topic, Harold, it's great that you bring this up, and that cycling air conditioners is not a new idea at all. So utilities have been doing this since the late 70s. And typically, and, and Honeywell was one of the kings of, of, of this type of program, where the utility, the vertically integrated utility, would say, we want you know, a commercial, uh, or sorry, a residential air conditioning cycling program, and they'd install a special thermostat and some switch gear to cycle your air conditioner, and you might get a bill credit of you know, three, four bucks a month for doing this. Converge uh, was a company that IPO'd about seven, eight years ago. Uh, you know, they built a whole business around this. Um, but what's so cool about Nest is it's not a utility-sponsored efficiency program, which tend to be very, you know, uh, um, inflexible type, you know, type one-size-fits-all programs. What Nest has done is partnered with deregulated energy <coughs> suppliers, and they're actually integrating with a live wholesale market in Texas, which is what makes it so exciting. And, and so that's hopefully coming to a, um, you know, a utility near you. But but there's a long, you know the sort of road to a smart grid is going to be much longer than I think people expect. And I think Texas right now is kind of, a, you know, an island as far as as what they're experiencing. It might be, you know, another eight years before we see the same thing in, in New England. Do you, as a venture capitalist, see a uh, capitalization of $3.2 billion for NAST? I, I'm not quite sure that's the right question to be answer, answering, but um, I think what Google saw, so let me, let me put my venture capitalist hat on for a second. We look for disruptive technologies and amazing teams that build incredible products for change markets. So they tick pretty much all those boxes. Tony Fidel brought 80 Apple engineers of the highest caliber with him to start his company. It doesn't happen every day. They sold a lot of thermostats and they went from zero to a lot of thermostats in a very short amount of time. That doesn't happen very often. They put they made people care about a very unloved category in a very short amount of time. So this company was on an absolute tear. Does that justify $3.2 billion? I don't know, I don't care really, but it got Google interested enough. Google had tried and failed to get into the home. And Nest got in there with a whole different set of, uh, of capabilities that Google does not really possess. Google does not have the same DNA that Apple has around uh, design. And Google clearly cares about the home because it's a place that it isn't and it wants to be everywhere. So let's get in the home and let's get in with Nest. And it probably means that Nest had a lot of other opportunities for further growth and further value creation that forced Google to pay $3.2 billion, things that we may not know about. The things that we do know about include 
Nest's product roadmap, we know the smoke detectors, they've already hit a massive speed bump on the smoke detectors, I'm not sure if you follow that, but the unloved products around your home, uh, locks, doorbells, you know, boring stuff, mm. suddenly could get, become cool and kind of part of a, a new set of hardware and connected hardware, intelligent hardware. So you could buy that hypothesis if you want. Um, so the venture capitalists who invested in Nest are pretty, they're happy, but some of them are actually, and they expressed it to me, they're actually quite disappointed that they sold out. Because this is probably a bigger company than even $3.2 billion. Um, I think what I take away from it is, if you're gonna play in this arena, you have to find ways to scale very fast. And that either means that you are the king of a channel, or you're the king of making people care, preferably both, the king of making people care about your product or service, you know, and, and wants to embrace it uh, and adopt it. We are talking about a fairly mundane thing. Energy is a pretty mundane thing in, in the general kind of life priorities. I'm afraid it is for me. My, there are 10 other things that come before uh, my electricity bill in my, in my mind, probably more than 10. Um, so, is it the right question? 3.2. Yes, great result for a lot of uh, a lot of fantastic engineers and some very great investors. Um, it could have been worth a lot more than that. Um, I'm not sure that Google is going to do it justice. To be honest, I think there's a sort of a mismatch between the the uh, the Google playbook and the Nest playbook. It's being run independently or separately uh, within Google right now. But we'll see if they can really generate that kind of return, the return that, that Google shareholders would want to get out of such an investment. Um, so, uh, to be seen. The, the comments made about uh, Nesta's utility endpoint are, uh, are fantastic. It, you know, I, I think that the, the Nest has made a couple of investments. A, small, a local Boston company called uh, My Energy was acquired, which is a, a way for, for them to access utility data, uh, a kind of a universal portal, if you will. And um, getting getting a, a company like Reliant, hyper competitive market like Texas, to engage uh, Nest is, is just adds sort of fuel to the fire. I hear about solar installers um, who give away Nests, and why do they give away Nests? It's something they can leave in the consumer's hands that they can use from day one, because they're going to have to wait three months for the solar to be put on their roofs and then connected. So let's. 250 bucks, I mean, that's just nothing. Let's just give them a nest and make them happy. And they'll think about the soul that's coming while they're looking at the nest, <laughs> right? Um, this is how people think. Um, have a baseline. Exactly, have a baseline. So, um, there are lots of other products that do just as well as Nest in terms of overall performance, but uh, that's kind of lost in the, in the noise sometimes. I will, I will say one of two other things. We were investors in Converge. Um, and you're absolutely right, this is old technology. It's a new business idea sometimes, but it's an old, it was old technology. Um, and we're also invested in a company called uh, Ecofactor, which uh, is, a, is a bet that in all this flurry of activity around uh, connected thermostats, that that will become the new normal. And the, the thermostat, the wireless thermostat that you have, if you're buying Jason's or if you're buying one from Honeywell, if you're buying one from Radio Thermostats of America, you buy one, it doesn't really matter. But uh, the Ecofactor provides the back-end service that allows you to manage that, that resource, um, just like any many other services that, that you buy on a regular basis. So it's energy efficiency, <coughs> demand response in a similar way that has been mentioned. Also, uh, HVAC um, control and, and management. So, it's really, um, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, there, there, we all know there are other thermostats that do just as good a job, but they have, you know, reinvented to such a degree that I, I was at a conference the, a few weeks ago in Austin and um, some of the Nest people were talking about how one of the biggest reasons that they get bought is as a Christmas present often, you know, from a husband to a wife instead of jewelry or something, so. Well, I, I wouldn't dare buy my wife. Um, <laughs> I, I would not uh, particularly appreciate that myself. I think she'd be quick. Um, but uh, I, I described this in the conversations earlier today as a kind of a dad Christmas present. Uh, I, around our office, dads and granddads got given, were given nests for Christmas. And it just was, oh, we can install this ourselves. That's kind of a fun thing to do. It's engaging, has that kind of, you know, uh, Apple 
like uh, user experience when you open the box and it's all the little screwdriver and like that. Um, and it's geeky, right? It's, it's sort of geeky and you can play with it. Um. Um, you just mentioned Google wants to be everywhere. I think this is a really nice segue. Just, Deborah, if you want to pick up where you left off before about, you know, how, if it isn't just, um, if data is big, what does that mean about our privacy? And and I'd love to know more about why you know so much about what's going to happen. I mean, I, I want to answer that question, but just in a in a in a nutshell, I mean, I think the you know again the idea of the smart home has been around for quite a while, which people have alluded to, and really the question becomes who's in, who's who's in charge? You know, who's running the home? Is it the owner of the home, who otherwise is it, or is it some external body and who? Um, who's the person or the entity running it. Uh, I think it, when you think about privacy, I mean, there are two underlying principles. Uh, one is uh, the control, uh, the locus of control, and maybe ownership of personal information. Sure, oh, I'm sorry, I figured it was picking me up enough. And then the second is the issue of proportionality. So is the solution in any way proportionate to the harm or the problem or the issue you're trying to uh, resolve, and lots of times, you know, we get this, uh, you know, killing a, a fly with a hammer sort of thing. So those are two underlying principles. Um, certainly, when you think about privacy, I mean, there is a very well articulated and well accepted uh, concept of what privacy and personal data protection is. It's kind of current right now in the United States. I've heard this quite a bit over the last three months or so. We don't know what privacy is. I don't know where that meme is coming from. I think it's another attempt to sort of, you know, push it to the side. But actually, um, privacy modern and privacy law is about 35 years old and it's one of the most successful bodies of law in the history of humanity. And uh, the trend toward global or toward protection of privacy and personal data is very strong and very vibrant and has been going on since the mid-70s. Uh, there are now 90 countries in the world that have data, they're called data protection laws, uh, laws that protect privacy and personal data. And the reason it's such a successful uh, global regime is, be is because of the high level of consistency of these laws from place to place to place. In addition, there are two international accords, which many, many countries have signed on to with, that protect privacy and uh, personal data. Uh, and there are also constitutional provisions in, in many countries. So it's actually a field that we know quite a lot about. So you're wondering, well, how come there it's such a roiling issue in the United States today. Well, in 1974, in the mid-70s, was sort of the beginning of the modern era of privacy. The U.S. was actually the leader in thinking about privacy and computerization and encouraged other countries to do the same and adopted the U.S. Privacy Act of 1974, which covers the federal public sector. And at that time in the 70s, the idea was the one big mainframe, and so it would be held by the government. So the idea of having a privacy law to address uh, government's one big mainframe. Uh, obviously, as things moved along, uh, it was realized there'd be, you know, many little brothers and, uh, you know, and obviously private sector use. So laws were developed that covered, um, they're called omnibus laws that cover the private and public sector. And things have gone along, again, continuously to this day, as I just described earlier. Um, the United States does not have uh, broad-based legislation that covers the private sector. So the United States has become the outlier of the very strong global trend that it created uh, back in the mid-70s. And so unlike most of the rest of the world, Sorry. almost every developed country and many developing countries, individuals in the United States do not <coughs> control and own their personal data by and large. And so what this has led to is kind of an open season, um, you know, where uh, as technology has developed, uh, Third parties have attempted to kind of grab the data and um, and extract the value from it. So I think for companies in the home space, I mean, there's the issue of the home, which has additional emotional value to it, very high emotional value. Um, you know, it's really a matter of, you know, if you're going to be a smash and grab operation and just try and extract, you know, as much personal data and then, you know, claim the value in that and extract all the value from that as soon as possible, or whether you're trying to create uh, some longevity as a business and establish a level of trust um, with the with your customers and so the issues are really in that to do that you need notice choice and consent do you want to yeah so i guess my question really is um you know for joey and susan 
at the end of the day, do you think the customer cares about privacy? Has anyone ever said to you, I don't want to nest because now I'm afraid that Google is going to know when I'm home, know when I'm sleeping? I mean, how big an issue is it actually for the consumer? I don't feel like we have never run across. I think you know um, pundits and the media are you know igniting the flames of concern around privacy. And we were the first DVR, and it was the same. I remember testifying in front of you know state legislatures, talking about we swear we're not going to, dis d you know, despite the fact that we can provide suggestions of what you based on what you watch, we're not extracting data and we're not sharing that data of your viewing habits with other people. And I think there's so many um, pipes into the home um, with broadband content, with um, the internet. Now, that doesn't mean that privacy is not important. And I think that, you know, we hold ourselves, we have very strict privacy policies in terms of even what information we share with our integration integration partners, um, what access inf of information we have based on what's going on in the home. So clearly, the rules of engagement are defined. Some companies elevate those rules of engagement, and our business philosophy is to do so, because I think if you mess with the trust of the consumer, that's far more of a disaster than the benefits you reap from trying to, you know, market the assets of that of that viewership and content. But I think that Google or Nest are just as people were really concerned about how do I, you know, eyeballs and video views and uh, cookies and everything else, there's a way of allowing consumers to opt in. And just as in Hulu, I can opt in to watch a commercial and get marketed to, and I can opt to pay to not have that. I think, you know, there, there might be a business model out there, not within our platform, but in others, that will give consumers choice as the way of you know, letting them participate in that interaction and behavior. So I, I would second uh, everything that Susan just said. Uh, we have not, we have not received direct questions regarding, uh, you know, if we install a smart thermostat, does that mean that people will now know, uh, like, the, well, does that mean we'll have Big Brother and people will now know these these things? Um, so, <coughs> Generally speaking, when our clients have uh, asked about smart homes, you know the, the question sometimes does come up, but it's very quickly brushed aside. Um, and and I would also say that um, our clients, at the end of the day, I think are actually more concerned about their privacy with the people they see every day, and that would be our company, than they are about the privacy with companies that they they don't see. Um, and I think that will have a significant effect on how this plays out in that really it, it's turned out that people really don't care, I think. Um, and uh, with us, we have to make a, a, we have to, we expend a lot of energy on making sure that the privacy rules within our company are strong and that there's audit trails behind everything we do. and. Um, you know, to, I frequently we tell our clients when we first meet them, you know, you need to know when you engage with us that we will become the weakest point in your life, right? In terms of security, if, if security and privacy is important, know that we will pretty much know everything, or at least have access to everything. If you'd like us to manage your technology, uh, but they've never asked that about Control Four or Gmail or you know uh, Comcast, who's actually providing all the data to the home. So it's. Uh, it's, I, I think eventually uh, it will subside as other things do, but it won't happen without the regulation that, that Deborah brought up, and it, it won't, um, I, I don't think it'll go away quietly if the market doesn't react properly. Uh, and I think we see that happening. Uh, I think the market is reacting properly, and I think we have uh, decent controls now, and I think it's only improving. Um, so there, there are great things on the horizon, and. By the way, we have clients who say, yes, I am you know, concerned about ABC, and so we, we don't go down that path. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, our clients end up overcoming those concerns, and they realize the utility behind the technology itself is far greater than any concern they might have uh, about the privacy. Deborah, did you want to? Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I think both of these country companies um, illustrate, you know, they've given their uh, customers notice 
clearly and very explicit notice, actually, in listening to both of them, uh, choice about how they want to proceed and uh, elicited uh, a level of consent from them. I think that really the issue, um, one of the issues here is kind of the creepy right, okay line. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to know when you're, and people use that word creepy, it's almost becoming a term of art, right? So where's, you know, when are you violating a boundary, when do you move into creepy? And so that's really the issue for uh, a company. And uh, what we found, again, and there's been a lot of polling of people all over the world about what they think about privacy, and just to give you very rough numbers on this, I mean, about 10% of people turn out to be totally privacy insensitive, so no matter what scenario you give them, they really don't care. About 10%, highly sensitive. No matter what you give them, they care a lot, you know, and they want more data protection. So that leaves for you guys, this is the part that I hope you wake up at 2 in the morning and think about, that leaves about 80%, you've done the math, that can swing violently and depending, and it tends to be very fact-based, violently from being completely insensitive to being highly sensitive, depending on the facts or presented. Based. And that's the right. stuff that crushes your business. So that's, you know, that's, that's the thing to, to be aware of. Can I just make it maybe it's probably a little flippant, but um, I think we would all feel differently if Facebook had bought Nest. <laughs> right? Just uh, so that maybe that we would be seen as creepy somehow. But um, Gmail is maybe not creepy, and Google is kind of Gmail in some respects. So I, I, it's a really interesting, really interesting line between creepy and... Yeah, and that's, you know, it, it varies, you yeah. know, for, for particular sectors. Well, I think just to that point, it, it's, um, you know, I've I've heard the people from Nest come out and say, um, we will not, we will absolutely not sell any of your data to third parties, but Google is technically not a third party anymore. So that might be creepy, because there is that loophole. And so I don't know. Again, there this is we're all really trying to predict the future here. But um, you know, you guys have very locked down privacy policies, and I think one of the things. Maybe you can speak to this, Deborah. Is is just what what can people do um, as privacy policies do vary? What should they be looking for? What should the consumer be looking for? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I was saying to someone before we uh, started tonight, I mean, I call privacy policies, for years I've called them, you know, Band-Aid over an unwashed wound. It would be better if there's no Band-Aid on it. You get some sunlight in there. It can get disinfected. You know, because these things are completely uh, in unenforceable. They're, you know, intentionally obfuscatory. They're useless. You know, they're worse than useless, right? They're, they're disadvantaging you as a consumer rather than helping you. So, you know, we've lived with that kind of privacy policy uh, regime for many years now. Um, but now uh, you, there's, there's movement movement in a more constructive direction. And over the last several years, uh, and if you start looking around the web, you'll see this, you know, privacy policies have started to become shorter. That's a good thing. And actually clearer. And people have done even simple things where they do uh, click-throughs. You know, they'll have the categories they're going to cover, whether it's, you know, third-party use of data, children's data, whatever it is. And so they may have a sentence. And if it's something that concerns you, you can click through and get more information. But you aren't faced immediately with, you know, reams of information that may be useless to you. So I think that's very helpful. And, you know, then to have companies actually, you know, stand behind what they say and do what they say they're going to do. And, you know, obviously there are very very simple privacy policies and they exist on the web. If you go look around, you'll find them and they're a sentence or two sentences or paragraph. And I encourage all of you to think about having a privacy policy that looks like that. Yeah, and someone who may have that type of private privacy policy is in fact Jason at MBU. Jason, you obviously have a different platform than Nest, but you are co still collecting data. What do you do with that data? How do you think about data? Sure. And, and how have you approached this issue? Sure. So we, we do this in a little bit different way. Um, one of the considerations um, we did have in mind from the design of our product in the beginning um, was how that data is actually managed and where it's stored. And one of the things we do that's different within our system is that, you know, pretty much all of the decision making, all of the data logging, all the things that happen, we have sensors, we have uh, energy use information. So we look at occupancy data, we look at a lot of factors in order to make smarter decisions about how to automate your heating and cooling. Um, we keep all of that local within the home or the 
the facility. So yes, there are ways that a customer through a mobile app or through an iPad or through a web application can come and they can access their system from outside the home. Uh, but we don't natively push control signals through uh, our own infrastructure, nor do we take that information and push that up into uh, our cloud, per se. So what we do is we provide efficiency data, which has been um, anonymized. It has, to, to the greatest extent possible for our service providers, uh, which has been aggregated, anonymized. We don't provide, so we give a service to heating and cooling service providers and building managers to alert them to issues. We alert them of the issue. We don't alert them to individual behaviors that are happening inside the house, which could tell them if somebody's home at any given moment or could tell them if you know a customer is at this 72 degree set point which would let them see you know Mary is home and Doug is not home so um, we've tried to be thoughtful in the construction of our our own product to only share as much information with ourselves as we need to provide the necessary services um, but but it's absolutely I think a consideration you know we we are not publicly selling our product yet um, we are absolutely taking I think a, uh, a thought full approach to privacy and how we're going to craft our privacy policy that we publish um, for our customers to see. Um, but, you know, it's also, I feel kind of strongly, maybe it's not in my own best interest here, but um, I don't think we can leave companies to, you know, their own best interests to act and, you know, on behalf of the consumer in the right way in every circumstance. So I do feel strongly that this is this is a place where, you know, we need our legislatures to take more specific actions because, you know, who are any of us to, can I renegotiate my privacy, you know, statement that I have with Google or, you know, even Control4 or my company? We can't afford, you know, a team of lawyers to work with every customer uh, to be able to customize those privacy policies. So, you know, this is, I think, an area where the government um, has applicability and I think we need to revisit um, with input from all of you um, how we do that. You know, that's great. And, and Susan, how about your company? How are you now thinking about the data? Uh, and do you actually capture data? Do you aggregate it? We can we can pull data in an, an anonymous fashion, but it's really for us to understand performance of systems, not necessarily what consumers are doing with the systems. So that informs um, service enhancements. It informs us as it relates to um, adoption of different various technologies and trends in the home as it relates to smart home technology. But we have no idea whose home we're pulling data from um, as much as it, as it is kind of an anonymous download of, d of data that is is kept in a separate database, cleansed, and then analyzed for purposes of product development and um, customer support enhancements. But that's, that's all we do. That makes sense. Daniel, I'd be curious to know, if you, as you thought about this issue, if you were Google, what would you do with the data, actually? If you, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, so it depends what the, uh, there's a little bit of uh, uncertainty about what, what they actually have inside that box on your wall. Um, I, I, first of all, I'd be, I'd be a little bit careful, actually, because they are, they're in relatively uncharted territory. Um, we've already heard mention tonight about occupancy. People talk a lot about occupancy. And are you homey, not home? someone's home when they shouldn't be home, <laughs> someone's not home when they should be home. You know, I would kind of stay clear of that. The, 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 <laughs> there, are, yeah, there are some, some fairly interesting, uh, simple use cases around uh, system performance. Um, I don't think that Google, I mean, if Google wants to sell, uh, you know, sell me information or sell me services related to the performance of my, of my heating equipment, it's kind of mundane, but it's actually important. Uh, I think that would be well received. Um, and there are, there are probably some sort of versions of that, that that could build into other services and products that they could sell to improve the performance of your house, whether it be uh, actual uh, pieces of equipment or, or other other uh, control algorithms. I don't, I'm not sure, quite sure I, I know yet what exactly what they're going to do with all that data. I honestly think that... Um, I think this is seen as a as a beachhead. I think it's seen as a, a way to get hardware inside the house that people value and then build from that with other devices. Uh, and now you have a 
you now have a, a relationship with with the company, and they can they can find other ways of either creating value or, or tailoring to your needs because they know a little bit more about your about your behavior. In, in the case of Facebook, you kind of tell Facebook what you like, and then it shoves it back down your throat. Um, Google's trying to sort of find out what you do, and then it's probably going to um, oh, shove that back down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know if, if on the Nest platform, as it stands right now, I could justify a huge amount of, of AdWords, you know, incremental, incremental revenue, which is basically what it would have to be for, for Google. Um, I think it's just that they got through the door, honestly, right now. Maybe you disagree. No, I don't disagree with that. I just want to add to what you're saying. I mean, data brokers today have hundreds, I mean, hmm. many hundreds of pieces of data about each one of us in this room. You know, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand pieces of data about you. You know, characteristics and things about you. So, um, you know, Susan mentioned personalization. I mean, that's the whole idea of advertising, is mass personalization. I mean, that's been the holy grail in, you know, across the board, not only with advertising, with products, with everything, uh, from the beginning of the internet. So the, the more data you have about an individual and the more longitudinal it is, you know, and the bigger variety, the better. And the more able you are effectively and economically to target to that person the kinds of things they might want to pay, put their money on. That's what it's about. And so, you know, clearly for Google to get inside the home has been important because they have, um, you know, the goal is sort of a 360 degree view of you, right? Through Gmail, through Chrome, through um, Google Plus, etc. I mean, there's a very uh, clear strategy, and so this just adds another extremely important element in terms of uh, an individual's behavior and what they're interested in and how they spend their time. So, uh, yes, it's very valuable, and um, you know, there's a lot to be had there. I don't want to undo what I previously said, but um, <laughs> the the fact that this Google wants to do a bit of hardware, right? Um, so does Facebook now with Oculus Rift, but uh, so Google wants to be a hardware and a software company, and so they wanted that ability to do hardware. Mm -hmm. I think that drove some of the thinking here. So I'm just further saying I'm not sure what AdWords Delta with Nest without with Nest. I don't know if you can tell Wall Street what that's going to be, but I think now they have a formidable hardware team, and so we can raise our expectations about what Google may be able to produce in terms of hardware. So that just a little <laughs> roll. Yeah, and then they sold it, but they sold the bits they didn't want. So yeah, um, but I agree. There's, there's, they want they want something in there. In fact, this is probably a good time to do some Q&A with the audience. Um, so I believe we uh, have a microphone set up, if I understand correctly. And it's very likely I don't understand correctly. So in that case, uh, l let me kick it off um, with Mike. It seems like you have a question. Yeah. Um, do you think there's value in the name brand Nest? Like, I'm a person, well, I've got four different zones in my house. I'm not going to spend $1,000 on thermostats. So I might end up at an Ocean State job lot or a, a bargain outlet buying, you know, something from China. Do you think people are going to have to worry about sort of black hat? players in the field, you know, that are going to use your information dubiously, as opposed to someone like Google, who, you know, yeah, they've got lots of information on me, but they've never offended me. Please, yeah. can I comment yeah. on this? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry to take the plug in, but, you know, I mean, again, as, as uh, I think you mentioned it, I mean, in uh, the Times in the last couple of days and other reporting, I mean, Nest Smoke Alarm is having a problem, and so they've, you know, had to, they are obviously reaching into your home, shutting it off for you, so they might decide they don't like you anymore, they're going to shut it off, or they'll shut off some other critical <laughs> system, you know, and so forth. So these are issues. Also, in today's Times, this was in the today today's paper, um, there was some reporting on, you know, uh, the way that they... Uh, put malware inside, an, I think it was an oil company, was through the online Chinese menu of a takeout place that a lot of the employees liked. And so, you know, again, they look for the weakest link, right? So, um, or, you know, with Target, again, I think they went into some kind of, you know. HVAC system. Yeah, the HVAC system. I, didn't, I was just hesitant to say that in this crowd, but I, I think that was, that was it. And uh, the HVAC system, you know, to get into the Target records. So what you're looking for, obviously, is the, you know, the, um, you know, point of vulnerability. And, uh, you know, and so there has already been talk about our refrigerator being our, you know, note of vulnerability in our home because the manufacturers of refrigerators aren't experts in computer security and so forth. So um, these are real concerns. Absolutely. So and not only uh, just 
the human capacity for negligence, fatigue, you know, ill-trained, et cetera, is huge. And then you go beyond that to some sort of malicious intent or anti-competitive intent, which is what your question is going to a little bit, um, you know, of, of uh, intentional uh, intrusion. Uh, certainly, I think this is all entirely foreseeable. In fact, will happen. And so we should be, you know, should be planning for this and providing for it already. The, uh, the conversation that we have with our clients on this topic happens frequently around wireless networks. And um, our clients always ask, probably more so in the past than they do these days, but uh, are you protecting my wireless network? Is it protected? And, uh, and so forth. And yes, it's protected. Well, is, can't they still break into it? Yes, they can still break into it. And so what we always tell our clients is, at the end of the day, you need to assume that if they want to get you, they will get you. And there is nothing you can do about that. And you need to just you know, uh, be smart about it, maybe have complex passwords, don't use the word password for your password, and, uh, you know, which is legitimately, legitimately a problem, right? And when we start working with our clients, we force them to have a complex password, and we don't allow them to operate otherwise. But um, the, at the end of the day, we, we tell our clients all the time, if somebody wants to camp out in front of your house and just sit there and hack away at your network, they're going to do it and you can't really stop them. But you'll probably notice that they're sitting there camped out or you know, one way or another, maybe you'll see that, maybe you won't. And you know, we'll, let's just be vigilant about it, let's be aware, let's observe, and let's set up the system with best practices to have a best chance at avoiding it in the first place. But at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable with some level of exposure. Um, and one way or another, it's going to happen, but all of our efforts here today, whether it's through uh, communication and transparency and um, government involvement are all great steps forward in hopefully minimizing the potential uh, for those things to happen, uh, especially by companies like Google, right? And hopefully that and that takes out like 99% of the threat. Just one more quick point I want to say on that. I, I think that is true, and I'm glad your customers are so understanding. I think as manufacturers, that does not absolve us of not the responsibility of, of also making as strong of uh, security protections as possible within our own products. Um, but you're right. This is only going to become a larger issue, right, as you begin to see uh, the very nature of the Internet of Things is to make small, very cheap, connected things that everyone can put in their house networks of sensor devices. Um, and if some of those devices don't have security first as part of uh, their communicating protocol, those can be points of vulnerability. And I think to your point, it is, it's a matter of proportionality and some of these are on segregated networks. And you know, if, if somebody can read an individual Zigbee sensor, um, it's not the same level of issue as if somebody can hack uh, in Target to actually say, you know, Target didn't take, this wasn't the HVAC manufacturer's fault, Target didn't take proper network segmentation practices to separate the, the private network they created for their HVAC vendor um, who was doing their management services from the rest of their core network. Um, so, you know, I hear a lot of talk in HVAC circles about that particular instance, and um, I place all of the blame on Target in that particular <laughs> respect. He brought up the HVAC. <laughs> or hack your pacemaker. Yes. One quick comment on that at the risk of extending this question for too long, but the, in, interesting with the credit cards, there, there's a case where big data is actually keeping us secure. So when that credit card's stolen, it's amazing how much data the bank has on us in terms of our spending habits. And somehow they're able to tell the difference when I travel for one day to Florida and, and cause a flurry of purchases, and I'm back the same day, and they are able to tell the difference between that and somebody using my card in Nebraska. And Big data, that's exactly what it is, right? They've built up a profile of me and my spending habits and how my family operates. And that, to some extent, is keeping me secure, right? At least from a financial perspective, it's more keeping the bank secure and you know they're not as exposed. And sometimes it's annoying. We have to then verify our purchases, you know, maybe in excess. Sometimes amount. they get it wrong too. And sometimes they get it wrong, sure. Um, but used in the right way, this stuff can help us, right? And also be a threat. And banks are a highly regulated industry precisely for those reasons. In terms um, of what they can do with that data. Yeah, Doug, did you have a question? I just wanted to add a comment, just a reflection back to the speakers. Here. I'm sitting here thinking outside the house. I've got a car 
which knows that aren't much about me, <laughs> that it's bright. Um, and I just learned the other day, I had a service call for my Verizon Fios system, and I found out from the technician that Verizon knows when my television is on. So if you want to find out whether all the homes in your neighborhood are occupied this evening or not, if you're a break-in guy, tap in the, the Vios line and get a job at Verizon. Check them out. <laughs> well, in fact, telematics, which is an automobile concept, right? It's where your car is talking to the web. It seems to me that brings up just as big a set of privacy issues Absolutely. as anything else that we're talking about right now. Pretty soon, every car on the road is going to have a data pipe going upstream and one implication, for example, is that if you decide to get your car maintained, not at the dealership, but if by the guy down the road, he won't have access to that data if we're not careful. So there's, there's, a, there's all kinds of places where this kicks in. Can I ask a question of Jim? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. As long as I've commandeered the, <laughs> the mic from long distance. Uh, I'd like for you to get a word in edgewise because this sounds very much like the aluminum hat argument of Fastly. And the privacy issue we haven't heard a lot about is the people who are not speaking to us, which is the utility companies, the smart grid ventures, the ideas of aggregated data where the value sits, not somebody who wants to see in my window and know if my heat is turned up too long. So can you sort of raise the focus a little bit out to the utility company level or the the aggregated data, not just the privacy issues that have been the focus? Sure, and I think, you know, I think to your point, if I'm in Texas, I don't worry about Reliant, you know, uh, have, have managing my, you know, air conditioner remotely. And, and it's not just Nest. So uh, there's a company called Ecovi. Uh, they make smart thermostats. Honeywell is also partnered with Direct Energy now. So th this isn't unique now to, I mean, Nest was the first to do it with, with Reliant. But, you know, if, if I'm trying to settle a residential load profile with ERCAP, which is a power grid in Texas, you know, I could care less what's happening at every single individual house. And, and you know, at that wholesale level, it's okay, did, if we cycled these thermostats, did the load drop to where we thought it would drop? It becomes sort of a, a big aggregated statistical analysis of how can you shape the load profile through modulating uh, things. So, you know, in, in that case, I think that you know, or for the utility, you know, it, it's a dispatchable resource, and they they could care less, you know, what you're doing at your house, and even if you're not home, great, but you know, even better because they can, you know, no one's going to notice that, that the HVAC may be cycling. Um, you know, so I think for those types of users, you know, worrying about assuming that their networks are secure, you know, privacy isn't really something that I think about. Uh, you know, and I think. It's funny you mentioned Easy Pass, and it's just a real quick aside, just kind of a funny story. So about 10 years ago, my wife, um, one of her, her co-workers, uh, went on a date with this guy in New York City at the time we were living in New Jersey, and she said, you know, it was a great date, but it was kind of strange. When we got to the toll booth of the Lincoln Tunnel, he took the Easy Pass, stuck it under the seat, paid in cash. And then we were out to dinner, and he paid for dinner in cash. And then we got, you know, a, a drink after dinner, he paid for that in cash. The whole night, you know, he just, just you know, he had 300 bucks in cash on him. Gee, like, that's really interesting. I wonder what he does. Well, it turns out he was married. And, uh, and, 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 and my wife's friend, she didn't find out that the guy she was dating was married until like the fourth or fifth date. So then that was kind of the end of it. But, um, but you know, so this was 2003 or 2004. It only takes three. <laughs> but today, you know, I think to your point, if, okay, so, you know, he didn't get busted from the easy pass, but his car, if it's a modern, you know, if it's a car from the last couple of years, his car knows where he went, his phone. I mean, this thing is, you know, your phone's a gold mine for law enforcement. Um, and, you know, the other thing I think of is, um, not that, you know, I'm out, you know, robbing banks and convenience stores or something, but, but let's say you say, oh, I was at home. Well, you know, right now, law enforcement can request your phone records and, and you know, see where you were if you're a person of interest. So, you know, I, I think that it'd be the same sort of concept towards, you know, your network house. Well, were you really at home? Let's find out. Um, and, you know, it's something you think about. But me as a consumer, you know, I'm like most other people. I say, yeah, yeah, okay, accept, accept, accept. Um, and then, you know, like with Facebook, I didn't realize until a couple of years how many 
apps were accessing my information through Facebook and just had a panic attack. So I get delete, 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 <laughs> you know, and got rid of them all. So I think, you know, I fall in that eighty percent range of, uh, you know, uh, I sort of care a, a little bit, but not enough to really do something about it. But but I think, you know, to your question, do I care about people aggregating my information as part of a utility management program? No. Uh, more Facebook. I, I've got a quick follow-up to yeah. that question. So this is just in my observation because we've, we've done some work in the utility space as well. Um, I mean, I'm thrilled to death that all of you are here tonight and we have a whole panel assembled to talk about, you know, what private companies are doing with this type of data. Um, but what I have found, especially in, you know, um, markets that are more regulated, um, is that the utility gets a much stronger reaction about their potential and perceived use of this smart grid mm, data right. uh, and much more scrutiny than what any private company is being subjected to. So do you find that also holds true in a, a more deregulated market like Texas? Are customers um, a little bit more comfortable with you know treating these as private entities and um, is there less pushback, I guess, for some of these utility smart grid programs that you find in Texas? That's a great question. I mean, I think it, it's pretty new. I, I think that, you know, so one thing in Texas is is all the smart meter data goes to this aggregator called Smart Meter Texas. So each utility, all the investor-owned utilities are kind of combined at one entity that manages the data in Texas. And, um, you know, part of the... Uh, um, you know, requirements. Deregulated energy suppliers are regulated, uh, you know, um, and so, you know, there are data standards, but I think that it's kind of a gray area. I, I think that, you know, there certainly are standards, and I think the, the companies that have moved first into the space tend to be, you know, well capitalized, uh, you know, reputable firms. So, like Reliant, you know, we talked about they're a subsidiary of NRG. I don't worry about them. You know, when you get some of, you know, maybe some low end, uh, you know, Johnny come lately's into the space. Um, you know, it, it, it may be different. So I think that you know the the actual regulated transmission distribution utility has, has a you know a very high standard, very uh, um, significant regulatory scrutiny. How some of the deregulated market actors deal with it, you know, I think it, we're, we're going to find out. My understanding of the you know situation with of people doing this today is that you know there's a pretty high level of, of uh, security, but. You know, it only takes one fly-by-night operator to have a big mistake to um, to, to change the, the way we perceive this. You know, Jim, that is the question. Jim, thank you very much. You know, we have cold beer, hopefully cold wine, hot food in the other room. So let's do this. Let's do one more question from the audience, and then we'll be here. We'll also be in the Venture Cafe, and we'll let everyone uh, have a good time. Okay, um, sir, in the front row. <coughs> uh, my name is Avery. Uh, I have a company that's called National Resource Management. We do for refrigeration what you guys are talking about for residential, and most of our work is commercial. And, and we're right now looking at, because the utility companies support what we do, they pick up a majority of the cost of our installations, and we've done probably 10,000 installations of Cumberland Farms, every liquor store in Massachusetts. Um, but one of the things that we've learned from doing so many jobs is not that you know people are worried about the temperatures it doesn't matter if Ness says your temperature is this or that it doesn't know if that thing has got a flat tire or not mm -hmm. and a lot of our customers we go to go like look you got this out and this is out would you drive your car with one flat tire your temperature is fine <coughs> yeah I know that but look what it's taken to get there it's like you drive yeah I can still get to work even though it's flat no problem you just use more energy and I think that the real meat here is using energy, it's not so much managing the temperature, it's is your equipment really performing the way it was designed? People's equipment we find is dirty, it's filthy, it's, it's the, the fuzz that builds up on your evaporator can cause you to have a 20-30% inefficiency. Sure. And that's where I see this, you know, with residential, the, the data, who cares about going to somebody's house? I mean, the money is where the targets are. You know, that's where that's where the big data is. Is and I think where where we have cold storage facilities, we have pharmaceutical. We've done right down the street here at Nova Artists. We have about 37 coolers. They can manage all of Harvard's dining facilities. You, well, let me ask you, Joey. Is that something that 
you do for your clients as far as, as manage the efficiency of their HVAC system? You know, it's when you were telling that story, the story that I'm thinking about is that we actually, and this, this probably goes back to my, uh, my, my nature. Uh, this starts even when I used to work at Starbucks. If somebody sounds really awful, maybe, but if a, 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 a pregnant person came in and asked for a, a quad Americano full of caffeine, <laughs> you know, I know that our team, would, our barista team, would actually have like discussions about whether we should make that a decaf or not. I mean, like the, so I then translate that over to today where we install lighting systems and by default we set our on, at least not for, um, for the incandescent bulbs, we set our, our sorry, yeah, the 90%. And I think we learned this from Control 4 when I went there for, for light training. Uh, we set all of our max on, so when you hit the dimmer switch to on, it just goes to 90%. Because if you go to 100%, you start getting decreased uh, uh, incremental return on the energy usage for those last 10 percentage points. They can still turn it on further to 100% if they want, but the default on state is 90%. And no one ever notices. We always tell them, we let them know, hey, we did this, and they actually appreciate it and like it. Um, no one's ever asked us to turn that back or ramp it up to 100. So we, we do it where we can. Um, when we do install the Nest, we turn on all the features and we make sure to take time to actually explain all the features to them because too many times I've heard clients, especially new clients who already have a Nest, will say, oh, you know, when we do an evaluation of their tech, we'll look at their Nest and we'll see they've disabled all the features. I say, well, why, why, why did you do that? And they said, oh, I don't like that it controls the stuff for me. And I sort of am a little confused as to why they even bought it, but it goes to the aesthetic comment that you made, right? Like they made this thing look cool. Uh, so we'll take the time to actually explain all the features and say if you just don't want it to control your schedule, we can turn off that one feature. But let me explain the, the cool wave feature, whichever one that one is called, where it, it will turn off the compressor to your AC and continue running the fan in order to coast into a uh, temperature uh, that you want. And you will then save that energy on that compressor usage for that last half hour. And they learn that and they're like, oh, wow, that's great. So we do it in our own way when we can. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm not sure uh, whether a, a client will like it if we start really analyzing their energy usage to that level of detail. Actually, we installed a monitoring system recently. We deployed it out to all of our clients. And the monitoring system uh, doesn't just tell us if devices are online or offline. It also tells us a little bit deeper and, and communicates with the devices. And for example, on a printer, it will tell us which ink cartridges are low on ink. Right, and we'll email out to the client and say, hey, just so you know you're low on ink, so we can ship you a new cartridge if you want. Um, and we debated whether to do something similar for when paper was low, because frequently low paper, no paper is actually an issue because the client will just keep printing and be frustrated, and we'll end up getting a service call on that anyway, or at least a, an email about it. And we did it on the first client, and she freaked out and pretty much said, no, like that's too much. Like I don't need to know that you know when my paper is low. So you know, I think there's a fine line, and we can figure out where that is. But you know, it's, uh, it's creepy. It's interesting to see if it does. It's creepy. Someone that just used the word creepy, right? But it it is, and that's what she said. You know, but she didn't say that when we told her about low ink. So we do it where we can. I think we're we're kind of trying to find the right balance. You know, where it makes people comfortable, where people are comfortable, and still adds value to their life. Um, oh my God! So. Fridges, refrigerators, knowing how much you're, you're eating late at night, and then you get a call. And you're out of milk. Totally, the doctor could be calling and say, "Why are you opening your fridge?" It's really <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that is a good place to stop. We will be, we will, speaking of food, exactly, we will be here to answer your questions. We'll be in the Venture Cafe, but I just want to take a moment to thank all the panelists for joining us here tonight. We very much appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. It's very nice to meet you. So, I'm very curious. Hi. Okay. Are you aware?